Hello everyone, this is Mr. Informal back with a new podcast. We are on the 92nd of the Mr. Informal podcast. And there are four topics for today. First and foremost, don't forget to add me on Instagram, M-I-S-T-E-R-I-N-F-O-R-M-A-L. Check out my website, mrinformal.com, M-R-I-N-F-O-R-M-A-L.com. So, these are the four topics for today. Number one, H&M hires a female CEO. Number two, how is the coronavirus affecting tech? Number three, Huawei overtakes Apple in regards to the phones. Number four, Coca-Cola is actually not getting rid of plastic. That's going to be interesting. So those are the four topics for today. Um, hopefully you learned something and hopefully uh, you kind of get a lot, you kind of have more uh, deeper understanding of what's going on in the world. And so let's go ahead and do the podcast. So first topic for today, we are on a retaildive.com. The article's uh, titled H&M names first female CEO as top leadership shuffles. Uh, Steph- uh, Stephen Person, chairman of the H&M group of retailers, is stepping down after more than two decades of leading the board, according to a press release. Persons release a succession plan Thursday that would replace him as chairman with the company's current CEO, Carl Johan Person, who is Stefan's person's son and grands uh, and the grandson of the fast fashion retailer's founder. The board named COO Helena Helmerson as the next CEO. Seems like again they're really uh, family related to replace Carl Johan Person effective me immediately. The company also named a new chief financial officer and appointed the current CFO to chief of the formal parent company of H&M, Rams Very Invest. So, on the first paragraph it says, Stefan Person, the time was right for the leadership change. Though a Dow Jones store described the shuffle as unexpected. In a release, Person said that we have gradually improved profits and have strong position with many well-established brands, millions of customers worldwide, and good financial strength. Okay, so if that's the case, then why make a CEO change then? So, basically, Hamilton started at H&M 1997 as econom- economist in the company's buying department before becoming CEO. She also served as the company's sustainability manager and production manager as CEO. She'll keep moving the company along a strategic plan, she said in a statement, noting that she would have a focus on the customer to continue strengthening our financial development in the short and long term. So, actually, so that's a great background for her in regards to uh, carbon footprint or environmental uh, uh, strategies. Not only that, it's quite interesting that they decided to have a woman. Um, why do I find that interesting? Because um maybe the candidates they had was male and maybe it's good marketing and press for them since they since h&m is one of the biggest uh, fashion brands out there they're everywhere and if when you announce a woman's then it becomes a big press it's it's gonna be a good press this is good press for h&m now in terms of repercussion well i don't know because uh we need to see we need to wait a couple of years on how she performs but as we all know h&m hasn't been doing so well in, t- in regards to image reputation also sales now they say that um sales is so uh let's see we expect h&m to continue continue to benefit from its best future proofing initiative in 2020 sales growing in december january um appeal relevance have not wavered so as you can tell they are not i wouldn't the profit and sales improvements 2019 carl Yuan person said were among the fruit of the company turnaround efforts uh which have included investment in digitations logistics and technology infrastructure analytics and artificial intelligence you see this is my problem with this okay they never talk about their employees 
it, it's always about electronics it's always about logistics it's i mean it's always behind the scenes how can they never talk about the employees how customer service it's always the same old thing you get what i mean the good thing is, according to data compiled by the Wall Street Journal, 2019 marked the first year H&M was able to raise its operating margin in almost 10 years, which is pretty good. But at the same time, my problem, again, my problem with this is the customer service of H&M and they have too many clothes. Whenever you get there, how many cashiers do they have? For men's, it's only one. For women's, probably three. But when there's a long line, they don't want to open things up. They don't want to have another cashier. Or they, they don't want to have a, tr a person who does transaction or payments. Not only that, as you know, H&M is still trying to have image problem. Right now, they don't know what they are. Are they a sustainable company? Are they still fast fashion? Are they still about um, being fashionable and trendsetters? There was a time when H&M was trendsetter. Now, I don't know. I guess Zara took over. And so we'll see how Helena does when it comes to to being CEO of one of the biggest brands in the world. So on to the second topic from Bloomberg technology section titled Coronavirus forces world's largest work from home experiment. That is interesting. Thanks to the coronavirus outbreak, working from home is no longer a privilege. It's a necessity. Yes, it is. Uh, while factories, shops, hotels, and restaurants are warning about plunging foot traffic that's transferring city centers into ghost town, behind the closed doors, apartments, and suburban homes, thousands of businesses are trying to figure out how to stay operational in the virtual world. It's a good opportunity for us to test working from home at scale, says Alvin Fu, Managing Director of Reprise Digital, a Shanghai ad agency with 400 people that's part of Interpublic Group. Obviously, not easy for us. Uh, not, it's not, not easy for a creative ad agency that brainstorms in a lot in person. It's going to mean a lot of video chats and phone calls, he said. So, another paragraph in the article. No one is taking meetings. My schedule is pretty empty, said Jeffrey Brower, a venture advisor in Hong Kong. One person emailed me, shall we meet somewhere in February? Uh, others say that they are using the time to typically spend whining and dining clients to clear their backlog of travel expenses. One said he shifted focus to deal with Southeast Asia. So this is interesting. It is actually affecting the way people work in China, basically working from home, but at the same time, they cannot whine and dine clients because of the coronavirus. Look. There's the there's a there should be a time and a place when health is much more important. I get your work. I get why you're working. I get I get it. Business is business. Profit is profit. But at the same time, when you have an outbreak like this, do you put business first, or do you put health first? I mean, people need to understand this virus. This virus, when it spreads, you won't know. And then that's when it actually, that's when you feel it, it's, I mean, the only time you'll feel is after two weeks of being infected by it. You'll feel the coughing, you'll feel the flu, two weeks. So during those two weeks, you're not, you don't feel sick. At the same time, you're spreading it all around. And then when it spreads, it's the same thing. Those people wait. Those people, uh, the coronavirus waits two weeks and then it pops out. So, I mean, I get why you're working at home, but at the same time, just be healthy. Like, don't even spread it. I mean, is this the mindset of people nowadays that that they don't care that they're willing to spread it at the same time they are still wanting to work? I mean, again, I just don't get it. So, bankers say IPOs and deals are on hold. Transaction value in the first 30 days of 2020 was half of what it was a year before, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. 
the worst is yet to come, said Nomura analyst at Ting Lu in a research note. We reckon coronavirus could deal a more severe blow to China's economy in near term relative to SARS in 2003. See, see what I'm saying? Like, again, we talk about profits, we talk about money here, and at the same time, no one's talking about health. Like, just stay home, don't even do nothing. If you want to email people, fine. If you want to chit chat, voice chat, talk to them, fine. But don't go out. People in the back of their mind are always thinking, oh, what about the business? What about the business? Well, crap. If you're not dead, if you, if you have infection and you're sick, what about the business? There won't be any business if you're out sick. It just doesn't make sense to me. On to the third topic from ArsTactica.com. Huawei outsells, outsells Apple in 2019 becomes number two global smartphone vendor. Wow. So while holding on to the number two spots is a big accomplishment for Huawei, the company's feature on the smartphone market currently looks pretty murky. The Trump administrators, Huawei export ban mean US company can no longer do business with Huawei. Huawei should be okay when it comes to hardware, as the company has aggressively cut US components out of its hardware supply line. The software, uh, however, has a serious problem. No US products means the Google ecosystem is off limits to Huawei. The Huawei phones didn't have access to Gmail, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Assistant, and the millions of apps on the Play Store. This seriously limits the appeal of Huawei phones outside China. Well, they did it themselves. They shot themselves in the foot. Now, backstory right here on the article, the, the export ban happened around the middle of the year, but at the time it only affected new products and the company's flagship uh, smartphone for the first half of 2019, the Huawei P30. Squeak around, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> squeak out the door in March, just a few months before the ban. So it, out, so it sells. Even today, with Google Apps, while well, we first product without Google Apps is a Mate 30 Pro. So, what do I think of this? This is good. Obviously, they want to be number one, but. I mean, this is just one of those cases that their hardware was spying on users. I mean, sending information back to China and the US was not down with that. Many countries were not down with that. And certainly Google is not down with that. They are not okay with those things. Right now, Apple seems to be number one. I mean, it is what it is. But when a China, Chinese phone wants to be number one, it seems like there's always um, concerns, privacy, uh, health issues. What I mean is health issues in the factory side. You get what I mean? They could be overworking people, so and so. Uh, reliability. I mean, do they even last? Yes, they maybe have the same components, but when it comes to testing, I don't think uh, they had the same reliable testing as others and then uh, they're cheap but again you question the reliability how cheap it is I mean how much do they have to go through and then maybe last but not least um, the availability of it I mean it's available in different countries it's not just the US I don't know why Huawei wants to take over the US or wants to sell as much as they can in the US even though there's so many countries in the world. I don't know why people are so fixated on selling in the US and again there's so many places in the world that you could sell. I get it. US is the number one consumer in the world. But for some reason are you that desperate to always think of the US, US, US? I mean when a company is that desperate to get in the US you know something is up especially especially in the technology sector because there's always a cyber war going on and not only that Huawei is not gonna lose money here I mean it's just one country I mean again just focus on other countries and then when it's time to go back to the US go back to it you should start doing something else, research and development, making better technology, so and so, but just do not have 
hardware that's, that sends info to the motherland. The last topic for this podcast comes from Supply Chain Dive. The title is Coca Cola says it won't ban plastic bottles because consumers like them. Really now. So, Coca Cola head of sustainability, Bea Perez, told BBC consumers like plastic packaged drinks because they're able to reseal the beverage in lightweight packaging. However, the other reports claim consumers are driving the demand for more alternatives to plastic packaging. She said, get, she said getting rid of plastic altogether and using only aluminum and glass packaging could push up the company's carbon footprint and hurt sales. No, I don't think so. You mean hurt profits, your profit margins. Business won't be in business if we don't accommodate consumers, she said. So as we change our bottling infrastructure, moving into recycling and innovate, we also have to show the consumer what opportunities are there that you will change us. So I don't get it. A few months ago, you wanted to ban plastic bottles and now you don't want to because of consumer demand demands. I'm sorry. When you ban plastic bottles, those were consumer demands. And now you're saying, okay, consumers want plastic bottle. What? That does not make sense to me. So, going on to the article, the company has made sustainability pledges in recent years, but it's not trying to get rid of plastic. Coca-Cola has announced goals for its packaging to be 100% recyclable by 2025. See, this, 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 that, that's my problem. And to make bottles with an average of 50% recycled material by 2030. Greenpeace has been critical of Coca-Cola's current plan, saying it doesn't address the urgency of plastic pollution. And I absolutely agree. So Coca-Cola's, uh, Coca, Coca, Coca-Cola, I'll just call them Coke, spokeswomen and more said in an email to Food Dive that packaging waste is a major problem. And Coke recognizes that it has a responsibility to help solve it. But all packaging has a potential environmental impact. So it's not as simple as saying one format is better than another. Well, it's better than having a plastic bottle. Moving on to another paragraph. Shame on Coke yet again hiding behind the public instead of taking responsibility for 120 billion plastic Coke bottles that pollute our planet every year. Co-founder of A Plastic Planet by uh, C.N. Sutherland. So, uh, look, if you're gonna pledge in something, go for it. But if you're not, if you're gonna do it half-ass, why even bother? Why? I mean, we keep talking. About, these companies always talk about environmental, environmental, carbon footprint, sustainability, recycle, and that stuff. It's all BS marketing. And yes, I do agree with the people saying that, okay, you are hiding behind the public instead of taking responsibility. You are pledging and yet you are not fulfilling your pledge. Why even make the pledge if you cannot fulfill it? And this is just bad because you know Coke is just a big, big company. I think that Whenever Coke is in your country, I feel that if you are a president or some kind of working in environment, you should just have them made in glass bottles. Don't even worry about plastic bottles. Scoop plastic bottles. Just make them be made in glass bottles. That's it. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that a company is is that big and yet for some reason cannot find alternative packaging. Um, Last paragraph says Pepsi will start packaging its Aquafina water products in aluminum cans this year for food service outlets and testing the change in retail. Smaller water brands such as Vita, uh, Coco's Ever and Ever are also using aluminum. And Nestle have also announced partnership with um, Danimer Scientific, a manufacturer of biodegradable uh, plastic products to develop biodegradable water bottles. So, let's see, that's interesting. Well, that's that. And so that basically concludes the Mr. Informal Podcast. 
92. I am Mr. Informal. Make sure to add me on Instagram, M I S D E R I N F O R M A L. And make sure to check out my website, Mr. Informal.com, M R I N F O R M A L.com. And so, hopefully, you learned something today, and hopefully, um, you, um, I guess, realize what kind of things out there in the world was happening and stay on top of the news and just so you know valentine's day is on a friday this year that's gonna be exciting and so i will see you in the next podcast bye bye